Hello and welcome to another edition of our ETF Insight Series, where we chat with innovative leaders within the ETF and digital assets ecosystem. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Gabriela Herculano, who is co-founder and CEO of iClimate Earth. Welcome, Gabby, and thank you for being here. So I thought, let's just kick it off. We'd love to hear about um, iClimate and what you do. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's a, a pleasure to talk to you, Andrea. So we are a London-based green fintech. We are almost two years old, and we started this business, I think, as a lot of startups, thinking that there was a problem that we wanted to address. And we feel very strongly about this. Um, we thought that the climate change um, investment story, the narrative was wrong. Um, the products, so decarbonization is very much our why, and ETF is our what and how for a variety of reasons. Um, it's a fantastic product, and I think your audience knows that very well, so no need to dwell on that. Um, but that decarbonization story, the products that are out there are not representing what we think is relevant, interesting, needed, and unique. So a lot of the products, they, they're they extremely broad and they focus on the companies that are doing less harm. F companies where decarbonization is a cost line item. Um, usually the constituents, the, the higher highest percentages go towards the same names, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. Well, they're great corporate citizens, but they're not going to decarbonize the planet. They are doing their share. The low hanging fruit is usually um, to procure energy from renewable sources, right? That's called scope two emissions. And then with that, you get very good ESG scores. Uh, so there are some climate change ETFs that are very much ESG uh, scores based. We think ESG is a, is a very interesting tool, but it's still a black box. Um, so a lot of products have been built with that kind of approach. And we think that there is um, a very clear limit to the impact that comes from companies where decarbonization is this cost line item. Um, and then you have another spectrum where um, you have ETFs that are extremely narrow, just green um, energy, solar, wind. It will take much more. It will take a very comprehensive set of solutions to bring us to a carbon neutrality. And that's the story that we desperately wanted to tell shifting the narrative and focusing on the companies where decarbonization is in line with their revenue. Those are the companies we think that are innovating. They are doing a lot of R&D on what is really relevant. And their products and services is a concept that is extremely fundamental to what we do. They enable avoidance. They allow us to move away from business as usual, where the solutions are fossil fuel based, to a new low um, carbon or, or, or zero carbon. We're using Zoom for this call. Telepresence is a solution that is represented. I didn't have to jump on a, on a taxi um, to go meet you. I didn't fly anywhere. Avoidance uh, then is the delta between the business as usual, the solutions that are very high intensity in terms of carbon and the, and the low emissions and the new solutions. So that's what we were desperately trying to represent. And so here in Europe, we have Obviously, a lot of a number of products has been an acceptance of ESG e ETFs for quite a while. Um, but in the U.S., they are a little bit behind than us. Where, why do you think that is? Well, the last administration really didn't put any effort into, into defining um, uh, ESG and um, encouraging the SEC to be um, very specific in terms of legislation, right? It is um, uh, um, financial services and financial products are high, highly regulated products. In Europe with SFDR, we are ahead. Um, I think there's no doubt, but with this new administration, I think we're seeing change and we're seeing very fast change. Um, I think on the 13th of June, the SEC just closed a public hearing where they asked all stakeholders to opine on climate disclosure. Um, and we think they are um, looking at what we've done in Europe and, and, and taking a lot of interest and going in a very similar direction. So with that, um, what we expect to see is ESG broadening. I think for all, us that, uh, all of us that work in the field, Right, we're in the tr trenches and we think that ESG is, is really big household acronym. It's not, not yet, uh, but it will become, I think, because the US is, is embracing this, is going to be very specific about legislation. We will stop greenwashing. We'll, we'll make a difference between um, the funds that definitely have that uh, environmental impact 
uh, we're all going to have to be much more specific about the methodologies, the approach, the metrics, which is all very, very good. And then with that, I think the ESG um, um, uh, interest will broaden. And a final comment that is not quite related to the US, but on that topic of ESG broadening, we think that for ESG to become a really truly universal um, concept, we need to see uh, two other key players, uh, Japan and China, to embrace it. We've had quite a few discussions with, with players in, in Asia recently. We think that they, they, there seems to be a great interest for the climate change mitigation and all the innovation and the technology and the transformation, which is, is very exciting. China definitely uh, putting a lot of um, effort and capital towards, for example, the electric vehicle and the battery side of things, um, but not quite adopting the S and the G, right? It's very much climate change mitigation as in innovation and technology. So until that happens, we're not going to have ESG being truly, truly universal, but I think we're definitely on the right track. And then finally, so there are obviously a number of products that clients can select out there. Um, what would you suggest in terms of the top three things that they should consider when analyzing different ESG ETFs against each other? I actually suggest four. Um, one is purpose, right? Make sure that that product has a very clear purpose and has a very clear idea of impact, right? What exactly it is, right? Um, um, ours is, is, is decarbonization. That is a very clear um, purpose and, and, and impact. Then second thing is uh, have um, a very clear metric. I think that the funds need to have um, a very tangible way to quantify that impact. Um, so hopefully we'll be less and less scorecards and ratings according to different data providers will have very different approaches. And there's definitely no consensus yet on, on what those should be. So again, for us, giving us an, as an example, our metric is potential avoided emissions in gigatons of CO2 equivalent avoided per year. We quantify that. Um, it's a very tangible metric and we're very open source. We talk about how we do that and what the numbers are like. The third thing is, let's be specific, is this holistic. Um, is it really E and S and G or you lead with one, which is our case, we definitely lead with E, but we incorporate um, social um, metrics and, and uh, governance metrics. And I think it's important, right, to be very specific about that. And that is my fourth one. If you do have that environmental, um, leading with environmental concept, you have to be very specific about negative screening. If you don't negative screen, well, then just be upfront about that and, and then let the, you know, I believe in capital markets, I think, you know, most of your audience would as well, then let us judge if that's okay or not. Um, I, I, I have seen products that in Europe are classified as a, a Article 9, so, you know, leading with environmental, and you look through the constituents, uh, I saw one that has a, um, a company in Germany that has 9,000 megawatts of coal-fired power plants. Um, I don't think that's justifiable, I, you know, but let's be upfront about that, right? So very four very clear ways for investors to look through, right, the, the ETF and, and understand if they are indeed that very robust um, ESG ETF, right? So purpose, impact, metric, is it holistic? And do you negative, negatively screen? And I think with that, if we, if we standardize a little bit the marketing, the language, right, and, and, and focus on these four, um, you know, uh, elements, I think that we would help investors to, to judge the products that they, you know, that they think are, are more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. That standardization is definitely, uh, Definitely needed in terms of improvement. Um, but thank you again, Gabriella. This is really interesting to hear your insights. Um, if anyone has any more questions for Gabriella, you can reach her directly at her email, which is gh at iclima.earth. And thank you again, everyone, for watching. Thank you.